What's Pennsylvania's economic climate like? We'll find out next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow of Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. And I want to welcome uh, Mara Donnelly, my co-host and associate to the show, as usual. Hello, Mara. Charlie. Hi. Why, the news uh, out of Washington, D.C. this week and across uh, the country for the last uh, several days is that the average American household has, in the last three and a half years, lost 40% of our wealth. Uh, wondering how you've been doing. Well, it, that, those are astounding numbers. And, you know, I'm, I'm an independent business person, so I've been feeling the pinch, that's for sure. Well, I guess we uh, fit right into that uh, category but as well. things are getting a little bit better, it seems. Uh, <laughs> well, you're one of the lucky ones because <laughs> I might make the argument that we're not in a recession, that I think that uh, and uh, this recovery is certainly, if it's a recovery, if it can be called that, it's one of the slowest in American history. I still think that we're in a depression. But someone who can provide more, um, more light on this subject and someone who can talk about the state of economics in Pennsylvania, we're lucky to have with us today, and that is, Dave Sanko, who is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Association of Township Supervisors. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks, Charlie. Good to be here. It's nice to have you back. Um, economic distress. Uh, we're feeling it in small businesses. We're feeling it in individual households. How are small communities, how are townships doing in this time uh, of economic uncertainty? I think uh, the, the struggling as uh, as everyone is uh, as the as income is down, uh, tax revenues are, are down as uh, uh, local governments uh, rely uh, inordinately on on a property tax uh, base. The value of those properties have have declined dramatically uh, over the last uh, last several years. So so we're. Uh, uh, they're all struggling, uh, and I think uh, uh, pleased at least from a, to, to say from a township perspective uh, that many of our members are, are continuing to do what they've always done, uh, and that's uh, uh, be efficient, provide good, high-quality service at affordable prices. And uh, there have been really very, very, very few uh, tax increases at the township level to to help make up for that. So it's it's important to be able to distinguish in tough times. Uh, you just don't keep spending. Uh, you got to put the brakes on. Uh, families do, uh, governments do too. Well, we've we've heard a lot about um, Act 47, and there are several different designations under Act 47 for municipalities in this area. One would be um, distressed municipality, one's, one, and the other one is we fiscal distress. Is, can you talk about the distinction between the two of those for municipalities? Well, I, I think the Act 47 communities are, are those that uh, have have asked for the asked the state for for help mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, have for several years have uh, have had spending that exceeded their revenues. Uh, and and don't really see see a way out of that. Uh, they uh, have have turned to the Commonwealth to to help with a, a fiscal recovery plan, uh, and and in some cases uh, uh, cash cash assistance. Uh, there are a lot of other communities that are are in fiscal distress uh, that are, are you know trending towards uh, being in trouble. Uh, but I want to want to point out that uh, for the most part, uh, the lion's share of all the communities in Pennsylvania are are doing just fine. Uh, and that, uh, you know, there are, uh, uh, of the, the 2,500 communities, uh, there are less than, uh, less than 50 uh, that are in fiscal distress. Those are, are, are Act 47 coverage, and, and they've been there for quite some time. Uh, and uh, in most instances, those are, are, are larger cities that have uh, uh, either spent beyond their means, uh, lost their tax base, uh, or uh, have been handcuffed by, handcuffed by some of the, the, the silly state regulations. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about cities, Dave. Of course, as you just made reference to, there are some such as Harrisburg, which is trying to put its financial house in order for some time with issues involving their waste incinerator. And now we have the city of Scranton, uh, where the mayor has uh, essentially um, um, decided to give everyone minimum wage. <laughs> uh, Scranton was the first distressed municipality, wasn't it? <laughs> including himself. Many, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, there have been there have been communities in Pennsylvania that have uh, been distressed for, for a long time and, yeah. and been in Act 47 for right. a long time. 
and and one of the uh, <coughs> one of the criticisms of, of Act 47 is that uh, it becomes uh, it becomes comfortable to mm -hmm. stay inside uh, and to have the protection uh, of the Commonwealth and and uh, uh, not not come out. So we we've not seen a lot of communities come out of uh, come out of Act 47 status. Uh, but there are, are there are some structural things that uh, that could help change that. But when a city such as Scranton or Harrisburg is in financial distress, some of the solutions seem to end up affecting the townships in in the area. Um, could you address that? Uh, how many townships across the Commonwealth find <coughs> themselves in this situation, and and how do they how do they deal with it? Uh, it seems like. Um, the, the solution or some of the solutions are almost beyond their beyond their reach. Well, um, I, I think it's it's important to to recognize that uh, uh, fiscal distress is caused by by overspending, uh, not by not having too much money. Uh, oftentimes, the the quick solution that everybody wants to figure out is let's just gather up more money. Mm -hmm. Let's throw, let's throw gobble up, throw more money at the problem. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's feed the beast. Let's let's gobble up uh, the surrounding townships because they've got a good tax base and they've got revenue and we can use their revenue. Uh, and and ultimately, all all that does is uh, delay delay the problem because uh, you will will take uh, communities that were doing okay and all of a sudden put them on the road. To, to fiscal distress uh, by having their money diverted to uh, to other more serious problems. It's it's probably way more important to address uh, uh, to to shut down the talk of, of consolidation and and grabbing suburban money uh, and and talk about how to fix the spending problems inside the uh, the troubled communities. Well, let's talk a little bit about the merger and consolidation issue because that's really been one of the um, issues that's come up as a solution to some of the distressed um, areas. Uh, why, there, you can read a million things about why that's a good idea. Why do you not think that communities in Pennsylvania, because there are 2,700 municipalities or some, number, some sure. huge number like that, why, should, why shouldn't they consolidate? Well, I think at the end of the day, uh, it, consolidation doesn't mean you're going to save money. Uh, because in every single instance where, where that's where it's occurred, uh, it, it hasn't saved money. I mean, you talk about, uh, uh, and I'll use an example of, of a couple communities want to consolidate or, or join together uh, their police departments. Uh, and you have four police chiefs. Uh, and they thought, oh, we'll save a lot of money and we'll only have one chief. Well, in reality, what you wind up with is, is four deputy chiefs uh, who still control their, their territory right. and one, one uber chief. <laughs> uh, uh, who, who, who essentially, really, if you think about it, has increased the cost of operating the Well, business. and they're probably still making the same amount of money they were as the, as they, the chief. They make the same money. <laughs> and, and one of the big challenges when you talk about consolidation uh, is that there are, are different pay and benefit packages in, in each community. And when you talk about merging them into to a single one, uh, and you've got uh, three or four different levels, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that everybody's going to settle in at the, at the high level uh, and not, uh, not at the low level. Yeah. So the cost will go up. What about the idea of taxing non-residents? Um, how is that flying uh, around well, the Commonwealth? Yeah, you know, we've seen and, and heard in, in recent years a, a lot of discussion about uh, a commuter tax, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, uh, been here, you know, regardless of where it's been, uh, whether it's been here in the mid-state or, or in more recently in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, ultimately, uh, the communities, the legislature had, had approved in the Allentown area uh, a tax, uh, the earned income tax would be diverted to the city of Allentown for, for a stadium, uh, for a hockey arena. Mm. Uh, and uh, that was just overturned in this recent budget uh, after a lot of a lot of public outcry. That is, you know, I'm not suggesting that that suburban communities don't want to be helpful uh, to to an urban core or to to regional assets, uh, but they have the ability and ought to have the, the the ability to do that on a voluntary basis, not uh, not on a mandatory basis. And we could probably spend an entire show just on Act 47 itself and the distressed municipalities and a lot of talk about it really doesn't have any teeth. It, um, it's a great idea and concept, but it just, just doesn't really function very well. As you said, a lot of these municipal municipalities have been deemed distressed, but they never worked their way out of it. They're, they never put in place the fiscal recovery plan, at least one that would work, and right. so on and so forth. But do you, do you see any hope for that act? Can it, can it be modified in any way that it would actually become a very helpful and useful uh, designation? 
Well, I think that the, the more importantly, uh, probably the way to help those communities out of fiscal distress are to fix some of the other issues that are, are keeping them inside of Act 47, that are keeping them in a state of fiscal distress. Uh, and that would be to change, uh, change the prevailing wage laws. Uh, to enable them to save that money. Uh, it would be to change the, uh, the some of the collective bargaining agreements, some of the Act 111 uh, agreements that uh, require binding arbitration for, for police and fire. Uh, and again, this is that is in no way meant to be uh, be critical of our heroes uh, in, in red, white, and blue, uh, our emergency responders. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, arbitrators, uh, have, as it's set up right now, uh, don't have to consider a community's ability to pay before they go off and just willy-nilly assign uh, some settlement fi figure. Okay, last question. We have two minutes remaining, Dave, and that is um, many of our um, uh, Southern brethren point out uh, the system that they use where they just have countywide governance. They don't have townships. Um, generally, they don't have boroughs. Um, they simply have cities and counties, and that's all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, many things are then all consolidated at the county level. Uh, do you ever foresee this type of a system um, being introduced in Pennsylvania or working in Pennsylvania? I, I, I would hope not. I mean, I don't. I, I think if we look at the the cost that an average citizen pays to our our southern border in Maryland uh, versus here, that the cost of the the county-run uh, government and the county-run school district, uh, the the cost that an individual pays is higher than what you pay in Pennsylvania to your state or to the county uh, uh, township and uh, and school district. So it, it, again there those costs of consolidation have, have exceeded the costs here and uh, you know everybody is inclined to want to have uh, want to have less government and, and I think the less government means less government intervention doesn't necessarily mean f fewer governments and that uh, the founding fathers established local government as a means that was able to, to communicate directly with residents and residents could affect most directly and uh, you'll lose that if you consolidate. Okay, very good. Well, we want to thank you for being with us and talking about communities and economic distress sure. and uh, we look for you in the next uh, uh, in the next uh, couple shows, okay? Very good. All right, Thanks. thank you, Dave. You bet, thank you. All right, we'll be back right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals to provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Underwriters of America, a better way for truck insurance and by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Penn Waste is proud to be a locally owned business. Since the company's founding in 2000, it has employed many of its neighbors as members of a dedicated team of professionals. Penn Waste is proud of its many contributions to the people of its service area through support of numerous community organizations such as Christmas Addicts and the Junior League of York. One more way they improve the quality of life where they live and work. Hi, welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. And on this segment of Behind the Headlines, Maura and I are following up Dave Sanko with Steve Hicks, who is the president of our state uh, teachers union uh, at the 14 state universities, APSCUF, uh, Steve Hicks. Steve, welcome back. Yeah, we haven't good seen to see you for, for a little while, and it's, right. it's good to see you are a man. Thank you for having me. You, you are quite welcome, but you are one of the hardest working men in the Commonwealth. Um, I doubt that. <laughs> it's good of you to say. Thank you. But uh, if there's a man who has uh, been in the spotlight and a man who is working hard, uh, it's certainly uh, it's certainly been you uh, leading up Abscuff. Um, you have been uh, working for how long to secure a new contract with the uh, Commonwealth? Uh, we've been without a contract since uh, June 30th of 2011, and. State law says that we go to the table uh, in August of the year before, so we're coming up on almost two years of negotiating. Wow. So. 
So yeah. then you have it, and this is one of the few times you've left the table uh, to uh, take a break. <laughs> we appreciate you coming well, and sharing your time and expertise uh, with uh, us. You, you know that's not really true, <laughs> Charlie, but that's, uh, it's good of you to say. It, it's been a long, a long process. Uh, clearly there are serious issues we have to deal with uh, with the state system, and we haven't had a whole lot of agreement on, on, on a number of things. Um, but uh, there are a couple things we've agreed on and, and done some good work on, I think, in terms of uh, internal workings of the contract and how things work. But, uh, you know, the, the big issues we haven't quite settled on. And uh, so it's, uh, we're running a little bit longer than everybody else in terms of getting a completed uh, deal. But we, we all have hopes that, you know, next time will be the time. Yeah. Mark, why don't you uh, lead us off? Well, in addition to uh, to negotiations, you've had to deal with some pretty significant budget issues in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I know the governor's proposal was going to have some pretty significant um, reductions. Sure. Uh, what, what was the outcome? All right. Uh, well, just to remind uh, everyone here that uh, because they may not study those uh, line items those in the numbers. Excel chart, <laughs> they may be looking at a different page than the one I memorized, but uh, the governor started off by proposing a 20% decrease to the funding to the state system, which is the 14 universities that are owned by the state, un unlike Penn State, Temple, Pitt, and Lincoln, which are state-related mm -hmm. and have a different set of rules. Uh, he proposed a 20% cut. Uh, in the end, uh, starting with the, a deal made in the Senate, uh, they changed uh, the line item to no cut uh, with a, an agreement and I, let me let me do air quotes here because no <laughs> one's exactly sure who signed what. But uh, there was an agreement with the leaders of the the state schools in the system uh, to keep tuition down in, in exchange for that funding. Uh, the Senate passed that, and eventually the House agreed with the the Senate number. So we ended up with no loss uh, of funding. Uh, we're going to stick with the same number that we had last year which is really a 2003 number. But, uh, I was going to say, you, you've been subjected to cuts in right, prior years, right. so it's not like you're skating. I, I, last year was an 18% cut, right. so we're still trying to figure out how to cope with, with a significant change in state funding. So, so that's where, where we ended up. Uh, in the end, uh, the Board of Governors uh, passed a 3% tuition increase, which uh, is somewhere around the rate of inflation and uh, it probably puts us in fairly good shape for, for the coming year, although it left about a $20 million gap in their proposed budget uh, that they laid out last fall. You know, their, their, their budget that would, uh, you know, just maintain things for the next year. But even so, it had to be a huge sigh of relief that uh, it was a no cut. I would let, let me, yes, <laughs> I, 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 there's a sigh of relief on the one hand let me say, I spend my life disappointed a lot because, um, well, last year everybody says, oh, you did great, it's only 18% cut, but it's an 18% cut, that's $90 million mm -hmm. that the state system doesn't have to work with, and essentially it's, it's a transfer to the students, so they're going to have to pay more. We, we had a large tuition increase last year, 7.5%. And so, you know, people are saying, you did great, instead of the 50% he, he, you know, it feels like a win when you lose 18%. <laughs> That's not a good thing. And again, yeah. this year it feels like a win when you come out with flat funding. Uh, but the system, you know, spends more money. Inflation is at least 3% or maybe more. And, you know, the 3% they're raising tuition doesn't fill the whole gap. Just to maintain what we're having, if we want to do new programs and we want to do, uh, you know, hire more faculty, then we, uh, we're not going in that direction. No. We're just barely maintaining. Mm -hmm. Well, are, in your mind, uh, is the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education and are our 14 universities fulfilling the mission that has been laid out for them uh, historically? Uh, I, I, think, I think they are. I, I think one of the problems that we're seeing these days is mission creep. And, and I'll talk what a little. Does, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, well, let, let's look historically at, at uh, what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we are modeled after California, where a fellow by the name of Kerr uh, came up with a system there in the early 60s that creates three tiers uh, in the higher education system, a community college system, 
a public four-year system, and then your research institutions that uh, do, do uh, things like engineering and law school and the higher level sciences and, and uh, you know, Penn State, of course, is our example. We adopted that in Pennsylvania in the early 60s, and you can see part of the effect is the deal they made with Pitt in the 60s brought Pitt in as one of the flagship institutions to, to because we didn't have enough research one, and Charlie understands the lingo, uh, the Carnegie Research One kind of institution. So they brought Pitt in as one of them and now is a state related. So we have a niche in, in that. So community colleges are supposed to be open access and do job training, uh, are supposed to be two year oriented and, and even preparation for you know going on to college. And uh, we currently have a law in Pennsylvania where 60 hours at any of the 14 community colleges uh, transfer straight to the four-year schools as a block so that they don't lose anything. So we have a nice seamless uh, transfer system. But the four-year schools are supposed to produce degrees uh, four-year degrees. It used to be education was mm -hmm. our biggest thing. Now, now I think business is our biggest degree across the system. Uh, but we, we're trying to prepare people for something other than a job. I mean, it's not just a job. People these days in, in the professions change jobs three to five times mm -hmm. in their career. We're trying to give them a broad-based education so that they can move from job to job without going back to college, going back and getting more training. That's part of what we do. Also, almost every university in the systems mission talks about the civic-minded nature. You know, they talk about Thomas Jefferson's quote about, you know, you need an educated electorate to have a democracy. I mean, that's part of our mission is to educate the mass number. I mean, we have 120,000 students. That's a big segment of the Pennsylvania population. You've talked about their families and everything. We're supposed to educate them in how to be better citizens, better people. and you know, be educated and be able to get, you know, a, a job at some sort of middle class professional kind of level. Well, and that's what you call mission creep? Is that? Well, is uh, it? mission creep is a problem that you have the three tiers. Okay. And, and uh, institutions have a tendency to look at another tier and want to go there. Oh. Uh, let, let's let's take for instance so the problem. Wannabes. They want to be something else. Well, we have a problem in Pennsylvania. We have 14 community colleges. But if you looked at the map, there is not a community college north of Interstate 80 in, in the Commonwealth. So uh, our institutions, Mansfield, Clarion, and Edinburgh, that are north of, of 80, fill in that mission. You know, you need you need two years degrees, you need some job training, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. So our institutions start looking to do that because local leaders and legislators say, hey, we need this around yeah. here because we're behind. I mean, the shale uh, industry has driven some of this. We need people trained right. to do certain things in the shale industry. So their missions are morphing to meet the needs of the communities that they're in. Well, yes. And, and the you, needs and, of Pennsylvania. And, yeah. and the needs of Pennsylvania. Uh, you can look at uh, some of the uh, state related and how they've put campuses in communities and offered two-year degrees as their, their basis. I mean, that's, that's mission creep. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are doing you know, you know, things that they weren't designed to do. And our problem with mission creep at this point, one, one of them is budgetary. I mean, go back to the conversation we just had. We're running on 2003 state dollars. We've kept tuition lower than anybody else in the, in the country the last six years. And we just don't have a lot of money. And instead of all our money going into our prime mission, you know, we're looking at all these other places that we're investing in. We, if you're doing two-year programs and technological two-year programs, you've got to buy equipment. You have to make an investment in all these programs. And I, I think it's an issue in Pennsylvania, and it's one that people are going to be talking about more, I think, as the weeks go by here in, in the fall, since the governor is inspiring us all to talk about higher ed the last couple of years. Well, in terms of um, education reform and reform in higher education, Steve, we hear talk of um, a business model right. uh, and of trying to apply a business model to higher education. What are your thoughts about that? What are your observations on doing that? Well, yeah, uh, business model is an interesting uh, concept. I'm all, you know, I'm an English professor, right, Charlie? So we, we always start with definition. What do you mean by a business model? I mean, I mean, what does somebody say when they talk about business model? Mm -hmm. If you're talking about 
what you know Mitt Romney t talks about when he worked at Bain creating a profit, you, you've got a problem with a business model at a university. If you're talking about what we're going to do in terms of competition with, with other universities, you've got a problem. I mean, the 14 are supposed to be a system, and here they are competing with one another for students or undercutting them on price. I mean, when I started in the system about 20 years ago, I think you've been around about as long as I did, Charlie, uh, the various institutions paid close attention to their fees because a $50 difference in fee meant they went from either the seventh most expensive state system school to the twelfth most expensive. And believe it or not, I was told that drove numbers in terms of admissions, that people, it, it was that price sensitive. So uh, those kinds of competitive issues and, and search for profits uh, are not a, a very positive thing. I mean, everybody these days, you know, we're taught Penn State has been in the news. And clearly, uh, there is a profit motive in what they were doing with football. And probably the next four years, they'll do a lot less of profit motive in football. But they had to make a certain amount of money in football to drive the institution, to drive every other sport. Well, when you start doing that, you start making decisions that may not be good for education. And that's our problem with the business model, is that you, you need to be thinking about quality education. What makes for quality education? And you know, business model, you know, to make more profits, you need more productivity, okay? Which means faculty need to teach more, right, Charlie? Mm -hmm. So is our, our mission as an institution to get faculty to do more productivity, or is our mission to make sure people are educated and they come out with a quality degree and a quality education that means when they get to their third career, they don't have to go back and, and get more education and spend, spend more money on it? Um, that, that's our problem with the, the whole business model. I, I think it misdirects uh, our decision making. And, uh, well, it sounds like you're having a little bit of an identity crisis. You, you've got some mission creep going on where there's a little un uncertainty as to what exactly you ought to be doing, but you, you're pretty sure that the business model isn't the way to go. How do you reconcile those two? How do you get the mission back on track to where it ought to be so that education is in the forefront and you're not trying to be somebody, be another institution? Or in the last minute of the show. <laughs> I, I have a minute to solve all the problems <laughs> of public <laughs> hiring. Your, your identity crisis. Well, I, I, I think one of the things <laughs> is you need, need more faculty input. I think a lot of... Uh, what's going on in talk about higher ed these days has been done uh, above the heads of the people in the trenches. And I, I think that's been a big issue that, uh, you know, think tanks keep coming up with these ideas that work in concept, but uh, most of the people on the ground don't, don't think or produce quality over and over again. Uh, there are lots of ways to save money and, and, and reduce quality uh, and most faculty members will recognize and be able to tell you uh, what's what. what. Yeah, what, yeah. You, what you need to do. And right. I, I think that's been a, a big failure in terms of uh, a whole series of decisions that have been made in, in, in nationally and in the Commonwealth over the last okay. few months. Well, well, thank you very much, Steve. I think you managed to wrap that up very nicely. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will be back next week with a new edition of Behind the Headlines. We'll see you then.